Uh, Sunday morning. I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. We did. At this time, I'm going to ask you to stand, if you will. I'm going to have Brother Rick lead us in a word of prayer, open in the services. Let's pray. Lord, it's good to be in your house. Lord, pray that you'd uh, be with those that are sick that couldn't be here. Pray, Lord, that you'd be with uh, baby Benjamin, my nephew, who's supposed to maybe come home this next week from the hospital, that Rick and Amy can enjoy the little guys. He can, uh, get home and get well. Thank you for uh, just looking after him, all the surgeries that he's had. Pray, Lord, that you would uh, be with the pastors to give us the message and uh, be with us that we would uh, be doers of the word, not just hearers of it. And uh, thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing, I know whom I have believed. Song number 409. 409. <clears throat> I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how this to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word brought peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that unto him against that day i know not how the spirit moves convincing men of sin revealing jesus through the word creating faith in him but i know who and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I'll walk the vale with him or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. You may be seated. Turn back to five, song number 405. 405. My faith has found a resting place. How many know this song? Oh, I know. I'm, I know you're not going to raise your hand, so I'm just going to read your mind. Okay. My faith has found a resting place, not in defies or creed I trust the ever living one his wounds for me shall plead I need no other argument I need no other plea it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me Enough for me that Jesus saves, this ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him, he'll never cast me out. 
I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. That's good singing. Young people, come on up here. We're going to sing Jesus Love Me, song number 579. Jesus Love Me, 579. Adults, this is a great song to sing. Five seventy nine. Ready? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide. He will wash away my sin, let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me. He will stay close beside me all the way. He's prepared a home for me. And someday his face I'll see. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Does anybody have a memory verse today? No memory verse? Okay. While the young people get their candy, so richly deserved, I'm going to have you folks stand up, go around, and welcome one another to the service this morning. Go ahead.
back to our seats and we'll sing another song. Well, it's good to hear your singing voices. As children of God, we should have something to sing about. You may be seated. Song number 436, 436. One of my favorite songs, Whiter Than Snow. Whiter Than Snow. Song number 436. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want Thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow. Yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, look down from your throne in the skies and help me to make a complete sacrifice. I give up myself and whatever I know. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, for this I most humbly entreat. I wait, blessed Lord, at thy crucified feet. By faith for my cleansing, I see your blood flow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me, and I shall be Amen. Lord Jesus, before you I patiently wait. Come now and within me a new heart create. To those who have sought you, you never said no. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let's stand together. We'll sing song 430, 430, another favorite. I must tell Jesus. Four thirty. Sing this out, folks. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver. Make of my troubles quickly and in. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, 
I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus, and he will help me. Over the world, the victory gives. Sing it out now. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, that Jesus can help me. Jesus alone. You may be seated at this time. Jack, now come on up. Last week we were supposed to do a, he was going to do a special, and I completely forgot. That's forgetting, though, that's not new news. <laughs> but Jack Nell is a, quite an accomplished pianist, and so I ask him to play for us this morning.
You know that song? Give thanks. You know, this week was the week that we set aside to practice giving thanks. And yet, as a child of God, we should be thankful each and every moment of each and every day. To be known as a child of God, realizing that it's nothing that I have done, but God loved me. God loved you that much. Let's stand together. We're going to read God's word and uh, then we'll get into the message. We're continuing our study in the book of 1 Peter. We're in chapter 3. And we're in verse 7. Last week uh, we talked about the wives and how wives can uh, bring their lost husbands to come to know the Lord. And today we're going to have one verse and we're going to talk to the husbands. But wives, remember, when applicable, you take this. While it may not have been written directly to you, it is for you, okay? So keep that in mind. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Let's pray together. Our Father, thank you so much for not leaving us without instruction. Thank you so much for preserving your perfect word. God, I pray this morning for each and every one that's here today. I ask God that we can lay aside our thoughts for the coming week and all the things we might have to do, and, and let's spend some time with you. We know that you're here. Your word says that where two or three are gathered together in your name, that you're in the midst of them. And so, Father, we praise you for your presence with us today. May we acknowledge that. May we be aware of that. May we reverence you. May we praise you. Have your will and way, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Before we try to dissect verse 7, I want us to go like to next some of next week's verses. Um, immediately following our text today, it says this in verse 8, verses 8 through 12. It says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful, pitiful be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. In his second inaugural address, Abraham Lincoln said these words. The country was in the middle of the Civil War and in real danger, literally being ripped apart and no longer being a nation. And he said this. He said, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. It's as if President Lincoln, in looking for wisdom, had been reading the scripture. Today in America as a nation and as a people, we can certainly take the advice given by Abraham Lincoln. We live in a tumultuous time. People are angry. People are fighting. They have a fighting spirit and they really don't know why. It's because they don't have Jesus in their heart. 
Similarly, this morning, I'd like to encourage all of us in here to get along. Oh, you say we get along. Get along. <laughs> Peter is continuing with the theme of subjection to God and the fact that when we are submitted to him, we will not have trouble being submitted one to another. You have trouble with submission? Go back to the root of the problem. You're not submitting to God. When husbands and wives practice what God prescribed for us, we look at it and it's often very contrary to what we think. I don't want to do that. It certainly is contrary to what our culture teaches, isn't it? But if you desire to have an orderly home in the eyes of God, we must look to his word for instruction. We say the word of God is what we hold to for all faith and practice. We need to truly do that. Just by a quick review, last week we discovered there are six ways that a wife can win their unbelieving husband. That's back in verses 1 through 6. First, by being in subjection to your husband. We found out that husbands and wives are equal, but they're not identical. Secondly, by chaste conduct. Who you, who you are speaks more loudly than what you say. By showing respect. The phrase there is coupled with fear. It's a proper reverence. Fourthly, by an inner beauty. Be known for the beauty that comes from within. Five, by trusting God. It gave Sarah as our example to trusting God. Even when your husband makes a foolish decision. Six, by doing good. A wife's witness comes through works, not words. And now, husbands, I know you've been waiting for it. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Let's start with the word likewise. Likewise. It means of equal degree. It's like Peter is saying, husbands, it's your turn. I gave these six verses to the ladies. Now it's your turn. We saw the same word, likewise, back in the first word of verse 1, chapter 3. It means a similar way. Listen. Wives are to submit. Husbands are to submit, just as Jesus submitted. He is our example. We need to let God's word fashion us and shape us. So how? Six ways. Six ways a husband is to love their wife. First, with companionship. With companionship. You know, as I'm, I'm preaching this, I really am preaching to me too. I'm a husband. And although I've been married a lot of years, I uh, need to pay attention to what God's word says. I remember years ago, I was, uh, went out to inspect some concrete work that there were a lot of cracks going on to it, and I'll not get into all the ins and outs of why it cracks. Other than this, I walked up and was looking at, uh, it was a, a, a um, project manager standing there for the company, and then the, the owner of the ready mix uh, paving contractor. And uh, as I walked up, I'm looking at out the cracks, and we're kind of looking together. And uh, I stepped over the, uh, the um, oh gosh, <laughs> the project manager stepped aside. And so I took aside the owner. And I started to let him know what I felt the problem was. He stopped me before I could even get started, and he said, if you're going to tell me that uh, I have put too much water into this mix, he said, I'm going to let you know that I've been doing this for 30 years. And about that time, I said, well, I think I'm done here. And, uh, really. And I walked on off the job because I was not going to support him in his error. And the, the thought went through my mind, yes, maybe you've been doing this for 30 years, but you've been doing it wrong for 30 years. You may have been married a lot of years, but you can still learn 
we may have been doing some things wrong. So let's pay attention. The first phrase, dwell with them. It means to dwell or reside together. But ultimately, it's kind of an intimate setting. The command is in the present tense. Yes, I said command. Dwell with them. It's not a suggestion. Dwell with them. The command's in the present tense, and it means that husbands are to hang out with your wife and live your life together. In Peter's day, husbands were generally uninterested in being friends with their wives. It was a different culture, a different culture. So this is very interesting. When Peter said this and gave them this command, a New Testament command, it was definitely counter-cultural to them. It had them in a shock. And I think we are really starting to see that again in our country as we've gotten away from God. Peter is basically saying, enjoy life with your wife. God said in Genesis 2.18, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. This word help refers to a partner or a companion, one who assists and supports. God placed Adam into deep sleep. And he removed a rib from his side. And from that he formed a woman. One preacher said the first thing Adam said upon seeing his wife was, Whoa, man. And that's where we get the word woman. It's not. Genesis 2, 23 said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Listen. One person said, out of his side to be his equal, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be loved. You're to love your wives. You're to love your wife. In his commentary, Matthew Henry said, the wife is to be looked upon not as a servant, but as a companion to the husband with whom he should freely converse and, listen to this, take Sweet counsel. God gave your wife a mind, the ability to think, the ability to reason. It's foolish to think that I'm going to make all the decisions. I'm going to take her counsel. Take sweet counsel as with a friend and in whose company he should take delight more than any others. I have a personal friend of mine that worked for a city. 41 years he did. And uh, very faithful to his job, did a great job. And he'd been vacillating back and forth when he was going to retire. And he finally decided that he was going to retire at the first of the year. This is about four years ago. So he went to his wife. His wife, he is telling me the story. He said she's working away, kind of had her head down, whatever she was, was that she was doing. And he said, I've decided that I'm going to retire. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be on this date. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, he said, uh, so I just want to let you know. And he said, when I finished talking, he said, she looked at me up at me and said, okay, but don't you mess up my schedule. You know, sometimes in marriage we get busy. Busy living in this world, and before you know it, the husband's going down one path, and the wife's going down another. Husbands need to learn to spend times with their wife. We need to learn to be a companion to her. Make certain you're on the same path with your wife. Don't get so busy in your job and what have you, thinking that, well, I'm trying to provide for the family and that's all to it. That's not all to it. There's a proper balance. Too often, husbands are companion with other guys, but not their wives. One survey stated that married couples spend less than three hours in conversation a week. Husbands determine to spend time with your wife. You cannot beat the importance of companionship. Second, with considerations. Husbands are to dwell with their wives, it says, according to knowledge. This has the idea of knowledge or learning by experience. It implies intimacy. Get to know your wife. 
get to know our fears, get to know our feelings, get to know our failures, get to know who she is. Our wives, husbands, should be the object of our study. You know, I used to get the newspaper and I'd love to go to the sports page. That was the only important page to me. I'd go to the sports page. I'd get back there and I'd open it up and I'd look at all the baseball scores especially and I'd read the box scores and I'd study those box scores. And if you asked me about it the next day, I could tell you what was going on. But we need to study our wives. Sometimes we're oblivious. <laughs> the other day, I looked at Alice and I said, is that a new top? She goes, I've had it about three years. <laughs> I said, oh, oh. We need to be observant. Be observant. Ask yourself this question. What does my wife need and what am I doing to meet those needs? Do you think in those terms? What's my wife need? What can I do for her? How can I help her today? You know, we should praise God for the wife he gave us. That would have been a good place for an amen. It should be our goal to enable her to live a life for the glory of God in any endeavor she puts her hands to. Oh, we get so wrapped up with our what we have in mind that we want to do, and we get so myopic in our thinking that we forget about her. The word husband originally meant one who holds the house together, like a manager who spends his time and resources wisely. Another image is that of a gardener who cultivates the soil and keeps the weeds out. I found this. As husbands then, we need to be planting seeds of security and then use the fertilizer of faithfulness, all the while watching to make sure the weeds are not allowed to choke out the love that is growing. As husbands, our responsibility is to love our wives by holding things together in the home and providing an environment for growth and fruitfulness. So we need to cultivate your companionship with your wife. Secondly, live in consideration of and for her. And then thirdly, cherish your wife. Cherish your wife. The next phrase here is giving honor unto the wife. The word giving is to grant, to portion out, to assign, to bestow. Again, this command is in the present tense, meaning that we are to be doing this continually. I did that yesterday. I did that last week. No, continually. Continually. To honor your wife is to hold her in high regard and to treasure her. You know, bothers me when I hear, yeah, I got to go see the old lady. You know. Sometimes we say that in jest and love. But sometimes not. Do you cherish her? Do you treasure her? Proverbs 31 11 says, The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. A few verses later, same chapter, her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. One Bible dictionary Describes showing honor this way. To show honor entails an effective side and a set of outward manifestations such as gestures or actions. Husband, think about before you answer this. Does your wife know that she's more important to you than anything else in your life? Good. Not, not coming at you, Adam. More than football. <laughs> you know? More than hanging out with the guys. 
more than fishing? Does she know it? Proverbs 31.10 says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Husbands, don't take the gift that God has given you for granted. Value her by spending time with her and speaking well of her. It's not hard for me to speak well of Alice. She does so many things so well. When I look at me being blessed with her, I often think I must have been that trial in my wife's life that God gave to her. You know what I'm saying? He blessed me. But that's the thing. God can bless both, both parties. Husbands and fathers, the most important thing that you can do is to love your children's mother and for them to know it. So we have companionship, consideration, cherish, and fourth, compensate. Compensate. The word translated wife is used here only here in the New Testament, and it means feminine, female. It helps us to understand what it means to be the weaker vessel. The word weaker is simply stating that in general, women are not as physically strong as men. They're the weaker vessel. The word vessel describes an object that's hollowed out for the purpose of containing something priceless. The idea behind weaker vessel is that a woman is extra special. And she's valuable. Man, what would you do without your wife? Treat her as the most delicate item. She needs protection. And she needs gentle care. Truth be told, husbands and wives are both vessels. In 2 Timothy 2.20 it reads, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Husbands and wives are both containers into which Christ does his work. Companionship, consideration, cherish, compensate, cooperate. Cooperate. A husband is not better or more special than his wife. They are equal in spiritual footing. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. And the internal importance they're equal. Why? Because they're partners. They're partners. Born again husbands and wives are, it says, heirs together of the grace of life. That means that we hold equal shares when it comes to salvation. I don't have anything on her. Romans 8.17 says we're joint heirs with Christ. Malachi 2.14 says, yet she is thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. Sadly, too, far too many husbands can be placed into one of two categories. Consider the words I'm using here. Dictator and jerk. Uh, what you say, right? That guy, he's a jerk. Oh, he's dictatorial. Many husbands are dictatorial in the way they lord over their wife. These dictators expect perfection of their wives while they don't think the same of themselves. And we're good for nothing jerks <laughs> when we do not meet the needs of our wife. Husbands, instead of being a dictator or a jerk, we're commanded what? To be biblical men and recognize that we are heirs together of the grace of life with our wives. Galatians 3, 28 and 29 told us this, remember, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There, neither is, there is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. I may be getting ahead of myself a little bit, but remember a pastor preaching and he looked at us and he said, men, you need to remember 
that your wife is a child of God. So you better be careful how you treat her. Boy, kind of made me think as a father, don't you mess with my children. If you mess with my children, you're messing with me. I remember we were up at youth camp and my youngest son had a little bat and he swung it like this and hit some rocks and he kind of went tumbling at these guys that are over there talking and one of them said, hey, and I stepped in front. I said, you have something to say? We had a Christian camp. No, I... Just relax. Husbands, we're to be bold and yet broken. We're to be a, a lion and yet a lamb. We're to be caring and not a coward. As a born-again husband, we are responsible. We're to be a responsible, Christ-like, Christ-like servant leader, a shepherd, a sheep, <laughs> that protects and makes provision in the home. Keep in mind, your wife is your sister in the Lord. So, Ricky, you, I guess technically you can go home and say, hello, Sister Christine. So we got companionship, consideration, cherish, compensate, cooperate, and last, connect. Connect. Something we do not consider enough husbands is the fact that how we treat our wife, listen to this, how you treat your wife has a direct impact on your spiritual life. You can't treat her like dirt. Specifically here, as we read this verse, Peter tells the husbands to love their wives. Why? Love your wives. Why? That your prayers be not hindered. Colossians 3.19 Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. In other words, love your wife with all your being. Don't take advantage of her. Remember, if you're not treating her right, then things between you and God will not be right. Simple as that. The word hindered was used of digging a trench to stop the enemy's advance. Let me tell you something. Satan will dig you a trench if you ignore or mistreat your wife. And you'll fall into that dip and not be able to move forward. Your prayers will be flat, futile. You'll think they're bouncing off the ceiling if there's friction in your marriage. You can't pray. Bitterness will put up a barrier. Conflict with your wife can and will affect your communication with God. Out where I live, kind of get in the foothills. And cell reception is sketchy. Sometimes I'll be talking to somebody and drop the call and call back. And I heard up to here. I heard up to here. I got up to this. If you're in conflict with your wife, your communication with God is going to be sketchy. Proverbs 15, 29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, husband, but heareth the prayer of the righteous. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. I think sometimes guys think that they're keeping the peace maybe by just going off and grumbling and mumbling in their heart and in their mind. Okay? God will not hear you. So let's try to put these six words into questions and consider them this morning. First, what one thing will you do to live in companionship so that you become best friends with your wife? You've got to set out with a plan. What are you going to do? Things have got to change around here. I'm talking to me. Things have got to change around here. 
What am I going to do? Second, what will you do to grow in consideration of your wife? The way you look at her. Third, how will you cherish your wife this week? How are you going to show that you love her? Fourth, in what ways will you compensate by valuing, valuing, valuing the vessel that God has entrusted to you? Fifth, are you striving to serve in cooperation with your wife? And then lastly, specifically, how will you connect spiritually with your wife, your partner? I was talking to Adam a little bit ago before the start of the service, and we we're talking about that semblance of a football game last Monday night. You had the Philadelphia Eagles who were eight and one, and they were playing the Kansas City Chiefs who were seven two. Seemed to be a pretty good game, except it seemed like none of the chief receivers could catch the ball. There was an old saying when we played ball and you dropped the ball, <laughs> your player next to you would look at you and go, you eat with those hands? I was watching the game. And there was one particular play, there were several, but one particular play that most likely would have won the game for Kansas City. The wide receiver had gotten past the defender. The ball was throw, well thrown. It comes down and hits him in the hands. He didn't make the catch. Receiver had stretched his body as far out as he go. He could go, hoping to make the catch, but he couldn't make the play. Similarly, I remember watching a baseball game. If I say the name Jim Jim Edmonds, anybody know that name? Jim Edmonds he was uh, an outfielder. He played center field several years for the Cardinals. I remember watching as the ball was hit directly over his head. He used to play kind of shallow. And he turned with his back to the plate, and he's running full tilt, all out. And he looked back up over his shoulder, and just as he got to the warning track, he dove outstretched like this and caught the ball. Fantastic play. You know, just as these athletes are stretched out with everything that they had within them, we need husbands to stretch out with everything that they have and make a de determination right now not to drop that ball, that gift that God has given you. Don't drop your duties, husband. Don't drop your duties. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to thank everybody for listening.